Hey, hey, I've been talking about rabbit hole for quite a long time now. Jump down the rabbit hole with me. This sauce is great in here. I'm, I'm telling you about the Derringer today. Derringer, Derringer is Kentucky straight bourbon finished in a PX sherry casks. And you might ask, who's sherry cask? Pedro Jimenez sherry cask. Delicious. From España. What makes Rabbit Hole so special is that they view bourbon as an artistic expression. All right, each of their original works of bourbon are made from one of a kind mash bill recipes using specially malted grains. Every Rabbit Hole expression is aged in both charred and toasted barrels. They're doubling down, my friends, including Derringer, this one specifically. It's award winning finished bourbon. All right, Rabbit Hole is taking their fine weeded bourbon, aged it in them Pedro Jimenez sherry cast from Spain. These aromas of caramel, gonna lure you in with that dry fruit and sweet wine, gonna have you falling in love. Darren's just perfectly sweet taste profile is a perfect sip to please both new drinkers and whiskey connoisseurs. Uh, it's, this award-winning spirit, by the way, scored a perfect 100 points at the Proof Awards. That's pretty good. They won double gold at the prestigious San Francisco Spirits Awards. You know how they take everything serious up there in San Francisco. And it was named uh, one of the 25 best bourbons of the 21st century by Rob Report. Get yourself some of the sauce. It's very, very good. It's available everywhere. Uh, it's a great bottle, great design, great sauce inside. It's simple and delicious, and that's what makes Rabbit Hole so good to me. They have four different expressions, but the Derringer one is uh, featured lately, and they're killing it. This stuff is very, very good. Find a bottle near you at rabbitholedistillery.com, rabbitholedistillery.com, or you can head, go ahead and go over to rabbitholedistillery.com slash drizzly and take $5 off your first order with a promo code RABBIT. You want to jump down that rabbit hole and drink responsible with me, friends. Go look for some rabbit hole near you. Enjoy. What up, Whiskey Ginger fans? Welcome back to the show. If it's your first time joining the show, welcome to the show. Good one to join today. Amazing director, uh, Steven Soderbergh is on. Incredible, so talented, and uh, so insightful. Such a good episode, and I was so happy to have him on. And we took a sip of Singani 63, his special sauce, that beautiful brandy that he brought over for me to share and enjoy. Uh, loved it so much. And also want to update you guys. I'm on the road again in the fall. In the fall, uh, Bobby and I are touring around the country. Go to badfriendspod.com, badfriendspod.com to see all the dates. We're in D.C., Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, uh, we go back to New York, we do Pittsburgh, we do outside of Cleveland. Uh, we are jumping around and adding dates as we go. So go to badfriendspod.com, badfriendspod.com. Enough rambling from me. Let's go to the episode. In here, we pour whisk, 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 whisk. You were that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Whiskey Dinner. My guest today is one of my favorite people on earth. I say that for all my guests, but I mean it once again today. It is the legendary Steven Soderbergh. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. You are very good, huh? I'm, this is quite a setup. You like this, right? Yeah. It's not bad. It's good. It's not bad. It's a, it's our it's my little house on the prairie. This is my little getaway from reality. I like to have a tiny little room to interview people in, uh, have a little something to sip on, and then uh, experience them in the privacy of this, what feels like it could be somebody's basement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Does this feel like a basement? Yeah. You Where'd you grow up? You're an Atlanta guy? Mm, I was born there. Yeah. But Louisiana. Louisiana. Okay, right on. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge, baby. So you brought us a little bit of sauce. Uh, yes. This is pretty incredible. Uh, the Singani 63. The labeling is beautiful. Do you want to explain a little bit about this for the people that have zero <laughs> knowledge of it? Yeah? Yes. Um, it's from Bolivia. Yeah. It's been around about 500 years. Wow. Um, I got hooked when we were making Che yeah. and um, decided to get into the booze business. Don't. Just don't. Don't. Do don't get in the booze business. No. Okay, good. So good, good plug for yourself. It's just why, because it's a it's a financial it's drain. It's yeah. really it's hard. Yeah. Super it, competitive. It's hard. Yeah. I am I mean, I imagine well, the thing that you always hear like uh, of the Clooney's of the world, you know, Clooney's success with Casamigos was kind of unprecedented, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. What those guys were able to do. And that's not the norm. No. You know. No. <laughs> like but of Clooney's not the norm. So what no. What else would happen to a guy who's so beautiful and successful and gorgeous, yeah. but some more success? 
a lot. The rich get richer, baby. Um, let's taste a little bit of this stuff. So first of all, Sagani 63, uh, Bolivian made. I've heard you quoted, you don't like to say the dirty B word for some reason. Why don't you like to say brandy? Well, because it confuses people. Yeah. Um, most people consider, they think of brandy, brown, snifter, right. library, old guy. Um, True. This is not that. So we got our own category as of February. Wow. It took eight years. Wow. A petitioning? How does that get, how does one you get You go to the done? government and yeah. say, we should have our own designation. Right. They say no. And then <laughs> you just keep going back and forth. Right. It's like dating in the 50s. Yeah. They're going to say no a lot. But those guys were persistent, and now they're my parents. And so that that's more accurate. Yeah. Brandy is confusing. Brandy is confusing. It smells great, though. I mean, very, it smells amazing. Very floral. Very floral. Kind of in the way that, like, um, kind of way that, that gin has its own distinction. Mm -hmm. This has a very obvious distinction. Yep. Um, I pour you uh, first, you. and you say when. Just call out when. When. Okay, very good. <laughs> and let me pour a little bit. But before we sip this and go get into it, um, I do want to pay my respects, tip my cap, say thank you so much for being here. This is an honor and a privilege. Um, for people that might not be up to speed on whom whom you are and have and understand your past, cheers, by the salud. way. Salud. Let's cheer. Salud, salud, salud. Or so we say, slanche mm. in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I spilled. I missed my mouth. Look, at look, look, look. I missed my mouth. Um... For people that that's really really good, that is really good. It's I I like it. It's very good. It's surprising. It's really clean. It's super floral, but it doesn't have any. There's no burn whatsoever. No, it there's just zero disappears. Burn. Yeah, it's like it's it's like gone in my mouth. It's yeah. almost cotton candy ish. Yeah, it's fast acting. It's fast acting. Yeah. Um, for people that don't know, uh, um, you are, uh quite your resume is is impressive for someone who isn't even aware of the business um on a personal level i think you've made such uh wonderful films i mean sex lies and videotape probably maybe the most uh historic of your works as far as one of your first pieces of cinema right yeah i mean you seems, wrote and directed seems it. very it seems quaint now yeah. right like his problem yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seems yeah. like very... Yeah, back then it was controversial yeah. and it was... Now it looks like Jane Austen. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, like a Hallmark, a Hallmark movie yeah, now. Yeah, like, that's a small problem. But in the back in the day, I, it was so uh, revolutionary to have, you know, to, I, look, to talk about the world of relationships and sex and love and uh, the, the human evolution of... Um, kind of like personal admittance of kinks and habits and blah, blah, blah with your partners. And it was so, you know, faux pas, whatever the word may be. And it is funny to think it is pretty tepid today. Like that film today, as good as the film itself is, yeah, categorically, it's, you would never be like, whoa, that's racy. Yeah. You know, no, exactly. no they're just wild. <laughs> yeah. You know, now yeah. you've got shows like, like there's the icon that's a new show that's out where they're like, People are just going. And that, yeah. That's the new world order is like show it all. But I would say that's probably, that was my introduction to you. Um, and then through the years, of course, you've made some of my favorite films in, in the oceans world. Aaron Brockovich was an incredible movie. I mean, I could name almost everything that you've, you've put together, but, uh, but what I'm interested in, um, the Che, che by the way, uh, but what I'm interested in too is um, the foray from going from like traffic to magic Mike is it's incredible because it's like a, such a different kind of cult love that you had when you had a cult love on oceans, you know, doing the oceans world, which for people that, you know, people that know to me, it's, it's like a return to an era that I was never privileged to have. Right. Like I right. never got to experience the rat pack, right. but I was obsessed because my dad was obsessed. So for me to kind of get into the oceans world in our generation with those guys, made me feel like we got, we got it. Like, oh yeah, we got the thing. Like right. that's our version. And then to transition to something like Magic Mike, which is a, like a, it's a international smash and it's a different kind of cult. Like, have you seen or your conversations with fans 
have been so broadly different over the years? Like you've watched it hit these different peaks and valleys of whom loves them? Well, you're just chasing what interests you. Right. So you never know where that's going to go. Right. Magic Mike was an offhand sort of comment um, by Channing when we were shooting Haywire. Right. I said, what are you working on? He said, I got this thing. I said, that's a great idea. Don't lose that. Like, pay attention to that. Um, A year later, he called, said, it's free and clear. Are you still interested? I said, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's Saturday Night Fever. It is Saturday Night Fever, except way sexier. Well. Way sexier. It's. Can I tell you how many times I've jerked off to Magic Mike? You can. Seven. (laughs) Seven. That's, that's Magic Mike one. Don't get me started about the trilogy. No, it's, 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 uh, it's sexuality. Uh, again, it's sexuality, new wave. It's new age sexuality where, you know, as you go back in time and you see what was sexy, questionable and dirty. It's like it pales in comparison to how everything has slowly progressed. Even Magic Mike is not, it's tepid compared to stuff that's out now. But the story is, story is What's so fun about it is you can see it from, you know, 20,000 feet. It looks like uh, it looks like showgirls guys or something. Yeah. But Um, then you see it and it's not at all. No, it's it's about relationships, real relationships. It's about work. I like knowing how people work and make money because we all have to. Um, So it just seemed like a hell yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah. And he's nice to look at with his shirt off. No yep. offense. I don't I imagine your body's great too. I just don't know if it's Channing great. That that works. Yeah, I his, don't know if it's his comparable. works. Yeah, his definitely yeah. works. When you see guys like that, it is funny cuz again, we're we're both regular guys, okay? We're regular guys. We try our best. I'm in the gym. I'm doing what I can. But when I work with guys like I worked with Efron in a movie a couple months ago, and when you work with guys that are built like machines, it really does remind you um, that God is not fair and that is okay. That you're like, I have something else he doesn't have. Yep. Not a lot, by the way. But that thing, whatever makes people be able to have that thing, God bless. Good yeah. for them. Yeah. I mean, I think they should sort of take advantage yeah. of that. Yeah, why I not? would. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but it's a long game. It is a long know? game. It's so. a long game. Yeah. Tell me, uh, I have, I, 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 there's a million ways to start with you and I was trying to figure out the best way, but to me, I want to know what was the earliest, because look, as someone who's an extremely acclaimed director, producer, writer, director being my assumption is the thing that you kind of uh, grab onto the the hardest. Mm -hmm. You love the most by far, because I don't know, sometimes guys write their whole lives and they're like, Hey, I've always kind of wanted to direct or, you, you know, I meet a lot of different versions where they surprise me, but um, your style is very unique to you. And and what I'm interested in is like the old cliche phrase of, you know, they ask comics, well, who was the first comic influence right. you? But do you remember a film when you were young that had a style that you were like, holy oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, well, it was Jaws. Jaws, yeah. That's when I started thinking about direct, like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. What is directed by mean? And I started to find out right? and decided I want to do that. Do you think it was the style choices of the shots that really kind of turned you on instead of being a, look, Jaws could have been a pretty shit movie for what it's worth. Any mo- anything can be, but yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get at is from a stylistic point of view, when you really see good direct directing, um, you just notice that those shots, they hum different. They stay with you longer. And that's when you really start to go, wow, that's directed really Yeah, well. my sense was there was something special and specific about the film yeah. and the film making. Right. And turned out there was. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at 12, it still, it just tilted me, you know. That, that was the shift. Yeah. Did you see it multiple times in theaters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I had heard. From, from my parents' generation was like, people would go... Yep. over and over and over to see it and still get shocked and scared. I would go on a Sunday and see all five 
shift. Holy I'd shit. I'd just sit there. So was that, this is the day where you could just ba buy a ticket and yeah. sit and no yeah. one said anything. Nobody yeah. cared. Yeah. Yeah. And this, is this in Louisiana? In the, yeah. This is in the South. Baton Rouge. Are you happy that you didn't end up with any sort of accent from down there? Or do you wish maybe it would have been... Per, uh, I didn't think about it. Um, no. My parents were from the North, so I just didn't hear it. Right. You know. You didn't catch it? No. I don't it, think so. It's No, you not at all. Okay. You sound... Um, this is me taking a weird shot. It just... It doesn't sound like... Uh, the accent doesn't convey intelligence. And I hate to say that because I'm sure there's a lot of rocket scientists with that good old Baton Rouge accent, but it is hard to hear. I don't know why. For you. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm from Chicago where everybody kind of sounds stupid, but it's lovable stupid. <laughs> like it's harmless. You know what I mean? It's like in the, in the world of, in the John Hughes world that was created of Chicagoans, it's accurate. They're lovable idiots. Right. I mean, they're harmless John Candies of the world. It's like, uh. Which, by the way, the other night with my my parents and my in laws, we watched uh, Uncle Buck, and I forgot how much I love that guy. Like he was he was so unique. Just like and, it, it, you know, something yeah. something was up with that guy. Where he, well, I think it's that joy of performing. Yeah, you know, yeah, like that that some people have, and it's very infectious. Yeah, he's but you got could it. tell like he loved doing it yeah and he was really good at it um so that's i always respond to that to those kind of people has there was there an actor like that in that world where they were taken early and you for a chunk of your career really wish you had were able to work with someone that you never got to work with well i hadn't thought of that because a lot of times uh, and i'll fill your head with something while you think about it you know as a performer there's people that i always say I'll probably never get to work with them, but man, that, it'd be a dream. And right. either they either pass or they quit or they're not doing it anymore or they don't really dip into the world as much and they do things once a year. So I think about that a lot about like, mm. particularly from my childhood too, you know? I think I tend to let it, let the universe sort of coordinate sure. all of that. Like I have lists of people that I've seen, like I just worked with Tim Oliphant. Yeah. Um, I saw him in Go in 1999. It was a long time And was ago. like, I like that guy. Yeah. Like, I just liked him. So that's a, a long callback. Yeah. But um, so I just, I let it kind of, you get who you're supposed to get. And so I, I tend to be fairly, you know, chill about that. People say no to me all the time. Yeah. And I still go back. And oh, that's awesome. So. That's a fear of a, of an actor, by the way. I mean, maybe it's me too, but a fear of like, when you say no to something, what if they fuck me off forever? That does feel like a real thing because person, you cannot deny that there's no such thing as, uh, you know, nonpartisan. We all have our favorites and we all have our Something rubs us away, and sometimes you're like, well, I'm not going to fucking go that way again. So it happens. I yep. mean, has an actor said no to you uh, that you thought was a shoe in yet? Like, why would they, like, you couldn't, like, it shocked you that they turned something down? No, because it's, it's, I have such empathy for that job. Yeah. Um, I, I find it incredible that people do it. I, it's hard for, people I think who don't do it to understand what level of vulnerability we're talking about. Yeah. Like it's intense. It is. I find it very intense to be around. And, and so I like to create a space where that's kind of acknowledged, but, um, but we're here to do it. Right. Um, so given that if somebody for reasons, because, they just don't see themselves in it or they don't respond to it. Like I, that's cool. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I know what I'm asking and if it's not a hell yeah, uh, then it should be a no. Right. You know, and it may be a hell, a hell yeah to the whole thing just to do it. That's fine. You know, they may go, well, I just want to, I want to see how this works. Right. You know, right. that's fine. Um, but I don't take it personally 
in in that sense. Sure. It's like if if you don't feel like you want to come to the party, that's totally fine. Yeah, sometimes people don't want to go to the party. Yeah. But I what you just said is pretty powerful. If it's not a hell yeah, then it should be a no. You know, and I, like I've had those. If you have the luxury to if you have the luxury, be in that yes. position. Yes. Um, if you have the ability to say yes and no to things, that is kind of a big part of it, right? Is I think people don't understand that. Like a lot of times we'll get asked, you know, when I do those, um, uh, what are they called? Those stupid press things. I can't remember the thing. Junk. Yeah. 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 But the, the, the one, the TV one is the, it's the acronym. It's like the whatever. Oh God. Yeah. It's at the Langham every year. It's like the whatever. Oh, the TCA. TCA. Yeah. 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 And uh, I got every detail of that except for the three letters. Thank you for saving me. But the, but the TCAs, they, they will occasionally say something to the effect of like, you know, what, you know, what made you say yes to this thing? And you're like, well, it's a combination of it was what was going on right now in my career. And there's not a ton of offers, you know, for any of us, really, unless you're at a very high level. But I think the public still assumes people bat away stuff. And you're like, that's a really privileged place. I, n almost nobody gets that. People do, but, you know, whenever they ask that, it's, I have to laugh. And I'm always like, it's what was no, coming it's, my way. It's, it's, it's a rare thing in life yeah. to have this much control over when you go to work, who you work with, yeah. how you're compensated. That is just not how most people go through life. No. Um, and I'm very aware of that. Um, which is why I think intention matters. Yeah. Like why you're there. I, I, I think everybody should have a really good reason for being there to do this. So that's what I request. Right. You know, what do you think the worst reason of being there is? Money. Yeah. What would you assume is like, do you? Now, having said that, again, sometimes you, you don't have a choice. Right. You know, but sometimes, sometimes you need the if money. You're, if you're fortunate enough to have a choice, I think, I feel like you should, you should, your intention should be really clear. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about what, there was an actor that you never got to work with that you always wish you could have? No. Yeah. No, no, I mean, there are, but... Again, I who knows what's coming. Yeah, who knows what's next. You know. That's true. Um, so I, I'm not a superstitious person, but um, I wouldn't want to jinx it. You don't have to beat around the bush. I will work with you. And I know that's what this is getting to. He's always said this for years to the people around him. And yeah, I'm going to do it. You call it and we'll do it. If we want to remake a historical film about a great Irish lad, uh... I'd be the face. I can't. I said this to my buddy today. How have I not been cast in anything Irish? Throw me in the background. Like, uh, not a lot. Of, Banshees of Inishirin could have been walking through, uh, you know, with a wheel and a stick. Would have loved to do that. Could have been a guy with a, a sheep herder. Could have done that. I'm just calling out my, I'm trying to manifest my destiny as well. Well, don't limit yourself. That's right. No, I'm not. I'm not. But it is weird. I mean, you know. Uh, there is something about the ginger uh, fascination. Hollywood has always kind of had this thing with redheads uh, where the females are these like just brooding, beautiful, fiery, sexy. And the guys are like pimple face, dork, loser, or they're the ultimate bully, like Farkas in right. Christmas Story. Like the worst assholes of all time. And only now in the recent years have we become like, semi-normalized you know that they're like yeah he's just a guy who happens to had a, a tremendous gene deficiency in his hair and something went awry i thought it was special yeah well it's rare it's very rare so yes that's I, special rare is special i'm hoping to change the narrative i'm i'm working hard on being uh a, a different version of the thing that we've always how, seen how freaked out would people be if you like got a total die job <laughs> i mean like uh, if you just went like another, black. Yeah, yeah, or like totally blonde. Like, yeah, what do, would people like? Just feel that they don't know you. Yeah, well, I mean, like, uh, it it is become a person part of my personality. Inherently, redheads for some reason might be the only colored hair that adopts this trait. Like it becomes you. Maybe I would say. 
blonde, when girls go to blonde, some women do say that they they really start to feel different about themselves, mm. about the way they present themselves. Uh, you really kind of be a redhead has to be a redhead, but that's but that's because of your history. Like like, you grew up being either teased or admired for being the weird, goofy. Uh, you had to do something because you already stood out. Right. You can't stand out and not be a thing. Like right. it was almost impossible for me to not be a loud, obnoxious goofball. It was in the cards. Uh, but I did one time dye my hair black for the show Dave that we do. Um, <laughs> they they dyed it black. We were in a dream sequence scene, and uh, I, I took it took me no shit five days to get the black out of my beard. It stained my face. Right. So when I had shaved my beard down, they gave me special soap. And it just wouldn't come out. Ugh. And I had a moment of panic where I was like, obviously it's not permanent, but I thought, how long will this last on my face? How many weeks am I going to have like an undertone? Uh, but if I, my girlfriend in college one time asked me to dye my hair, she was like, wouldn't that be fun? And we dyed really? it like a brownish color. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe I did that. I have no idea why I did that. She, I think she wanted to sleep with someone else who had brown hair that was 6'1 and was pale. She was changing you she was changing yeah me. yeah she um, didn't want me yeah. it's yeah that's kind of why you can't you can never give um a woman perfume ah because what is that saying yeah you should smell different yeah but you can give a guy perfume because it's saying you should smell better yes yeah a girl you have to let them be yeah i think it's i think you've got to be happy with what's in front uh, what of arrives yeah, yeah. cuz yeah. if you yeah it's just it's what is that conversation yeah how do you start that i don't it's almost like uh you know they know at this point in a woman's relationship if you're married or you've been with someone for a long time when they ask you how, how do i look in this they know you have to say great but they still need you to do a version of it so you'll go great but i don't like that color as much as the other dress that you have that I love. Right. So you have to, you have to yes and it. You have a yes, it's an improv lesson. Dating is improv lessons for men of like, yes, but, but, and you also look so good in the gold. Well, and as they, as you know, one of the cardinal rules of improv is you don't say no. You don't say no. You yeah, don't you say shut yes. shit down. No. Like you, you keep the ball afloat. Yeah, you so, have to. But I think each of those situations it's good to have an approach, but you never, you just never know no. like what's, what's going to happen or what they're going to, in this specific context, what they're going to be wearing right. and asking for an opinion on, um, what, what happened that week? Yeah. You know, what, what time of day week? is it now? <laughs> right. Like, are we early? Are we running behind? Like there are a lot of factors that I think you've got to surf to make sure you do the right thing. And I think there is a right way to do yes. that. I would certainly hope for the same, a version of that coming back to me. Yeah. If, if I said like, dude, is this, am I okay? And, but I usually avoid it. I just throw it together and go, I'll figure it out. I, 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 I'll just, if I look dumb, I look dumb. But if she looks good, it's it's a it's a win. It doesn't matter. That's true. Because most men look stupid against their partners anyway, so it's never a competition. You just want to look decent enough that that your partner's not like, what is that? What the fuck are you wearing? Yes. Yeah. What? Why you, would you wear? You that? would like to. You would like people to think, um, you're playing it a certain level yeah and that she's not slumming yeah that you belong in the league yeah yeah you belong yeah in. so i think you're coming off the bench but you belong in the game i think there's a again a, a equilibrium there of not looking like you spend too much time yeah thinking about that but that you don't spend no time right that yeah. that's interesting you say this because i i was uh when i looked at your outfit when you walked in i thought here's a professional adult male and i'm <laughs> always curious of what directors wear when they direct right there's the typical joke that directors always wear like you know super comfy and a hat they always have this. like a hat not yeah. these shoes i have boots 
but you wear exactly I dress, what you're wearing. I dress like this. But you have you co- have you consciously done this, or is this just a natural? Well, thing? it's it's because I'm also operating the camera. The black is not a, a pretentious move. This is a real world practical thing that that there's a, a less of a chance I will appear in a reflection of something while I'm operating the camera if I'm wearing black. Right. So I can hide. So that's. But it turns out. I just do it all the time. You love black. It's easy. Yeah, it, I, I wear mostly dark. And you can spill dark. shit on it. Like this, look, and I'm already dry. Yeah, that's Nobody true. even knew. In here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. This episode of Whiskey Junior is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, Squarespace, I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, it's an all-in-one website platform uh, for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. I've been using it for years. It is amazing. Whether you, If you're just starting out, Uh, or you're an expert in managing and growing a brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, all on your terms. That's the best part about it. Squarespace really helps you develop a site where you can showcase whatever you're trying to sell, whether you're a, uh, you know, whether you're a comedian who's looking to put up dates online, huh, like me, or... You know, you're a personal trainer and you want to have a calendar and a schedule up there with videos to show people what you do. Um, give a little teaser on how to do uh, kettlebell curls. Huh? Huh? Uh, Squarespace has all sorts of great stuff. They have an online store. So if you're selling, you know, merch and shirts um, and uh, you have an asset library that helps you upload, organize and access all your content from one place. Um, with this new asset library, you're able to manage all your files from one central hub and use them across the Squarespace platform. So it looks really seamless when you're creating a site and whether you're building something to sell or you're building something to display, um, these flexible website templates are so incredible. They have professional templates already laid out for you. Uh, if you want to go rogue, go do it yourself, go ahead. But, uh, you can take any of these Squarespace templates, do whatever you want. Your idea, it's your brand, your business can stand out online on every device. It's not just uh, for the computer. It's also for the mobile. Uh, you can host video content, like I said, and organize your video library and showcase your content on beautiful beautiful video pages and sell access to your videos with member areas. Make it exclusive, baby. Huh? You got inside tips? Make it exclusive. Uh, I've been using Squarespace and I love it so much. I've always been one who needs help when I'm doing something like this to creatively design something online. So thank God that they have templates that are easy to use uh, and easy to format to fit your brand. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use uh, squarespace.com slash whiskey. Huh? Squarespace.com slash whiskey to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, go over to squarespace.com. When you're ready to launch, after you use a free trial, go to squarespace.com slash whiskey to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hey, have you ever looked at your name on Google? It can be so daunting. You know, with me, it's like, look at this stupid, ugly ginger out at a restaurant. But for you at home, it might be your full legal name, your email, your home address, phone numbers. Everything can be found online that's personal to you. Uh, And it's daunting. I can't believe that it's out there like this. There should be something that restricts it. But I got to tell you, Aura is here to help. Thrilled to partner with Aura. They're great. An all-in-one online safety solution that helps protect you and your family from identity theft, financial fraud, and online threats before they happen. With Aura, you can rest easy knowing that someone is looking out for you. Someone got your back over there at Aura, my friend. The app, uh, what it does, it scans the dark web to look for your email addresses, passwords, social security numbers, sensitive information that you put out to the web, knowingly or unknowingly. And if it's found, you're going to get an alert in real time, which is even you know even better. They're not waiting to collect a bunch of data. They're going to tell you right away if something pops up. Hey, man, you know, these passwords, these numbers, these access codes are available. And they offer uh, a suite of tools to protect you and your loved ones. Uh, those real-time alerts, suspicious credit card activity, computer virus protection, parental controls, a VPN, and a password manager that does everything all at once. The best part that I like is they re- uh, they help reduce annoying robocalls, telemarketers, and junk mail. They send takedown requests on your behalf regularly. Look, if you're if you're an adult that's using credit cards online, like everybody is these days, you are vulnerable. And not to scare you, but you might as well protect yourself a little bit more from being open on the internet like that. And for a limited time, Aura is offering our listeners a 14-day trial plus a check of your data to see if your personal information has been leaked online. All for free. That's for free. When you visit Aura.com slash whiskey, that is Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash whiskey to sign up today for a 14-day free trial and start protecting you and your loved ones. All right? Do yourself a favor. Do what I did. Get protected from all your information being out online. That's Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash whiskey. Certain terms apply. Be sure to look for the site for details. Ginger. I like gingers. 
I, I thought usually with directors, it, that obviously makes perfect sense. And I always thought it was a lot of directors don't want the attention eye on them at all. So when you're looking back, you're not really seeing anybody. You know, obviously that's why crew and stage hands always kind of dress dark. So it's like there's no stealing any eyeline or yep. making a, a, a noise or attention of it. Um, how now, brown cow, how now in this current age do you feel like your selection of projects varied from, you know, even let's say five or seven years ago? Has there been a shift the way you choose? No, I mean, look, a lot of the, a lot of how something hits you has to do with what you're coming out of. I'm, I'm most, I'm, I'm most interested in finding something that feels like it'll annihilate the thing that I just did. Uh, you know, I want something, I want to move in a different direction. So that's, that's a big part of it. Um, but then again, it's, it's not, it's, it's something you can't really control completely. Um, you know, I'll set things up to start, um, the process of seeing if there's a project there. Um, Sometimes they come together really quickly and sometimes, you know, they take years. Um, and your, you, your relationship to them changes. And so hence the hell yeah, like if it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. It's, it can be hard sometimes to, to say no to something you've put a lot of time into, other people have put a lot of time into, but, um, you have to, it's the, the work is, is I respect the work too much for, for, for it not to be a hell yeah. Right. Like you can't do it as a favor to yeah. someone like you've really, you, you know, my, my <clears throat> attitude is I, the, everything I've ever made, I would have made for free. And some of them I did, right. and some of them I lost money because I put money into them. Jesus. Um, so, as as long as that's the key motivation, which is being in love with it on set, um, then I think you know that's pretty clear. What's the most, uh, if you can, or if it? What's the most over budget you ever were on what film? What film was like, holy shit, we spent way too much time. Um, we went over a little bit on Che, but not my, I covered it. Right. Like nobody got, nobody nobody lost more than they were supposed to. Right, um, right. Which is the film industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, that's always just been a rule with me is that even to the point of, uh, depending on the project, um, creating within the budget a reshoot component. Sure. You know, going, we're going to go back. I always go back. There's always something. So let's just budget for it, schedule for it. Um, but I don't, I feel like that's the deal. If, if we agree on what the thing is and the number, if I hit the number, I get to do what I want. Right. That's the, that's the contract. So I take it seriously. I take other people's money seriously. Yeah. Cause you have to at the end of the day. Well, I think it's a, I think it's, it's respectful. And over time, that's, that's a good way to be. Sure. You know, cause you, you want to really reduce the number of reasons that people don't want to work with you right and so many of them most of them i would argue are well within your control like how you behave yeah and so this is an instance where if you're known as somebody who doesn't give a shit about the budget well that's that goes in the file <laughs> yeah. you know it's, it's logged in yeah and it sits right there yeah and it's they in remember like it. all caps right right doesn't give Care a shit about, about the your fucking, money. Oh, your fucking <laughs> yeah. money. Yeah. So. But it is, it, it's a big part of the business. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting now that years ago, 
nobody really spoke about pub on a public forum. People weren't really talking about like, this is how much it costs, this is how much it made. Now, like box office mojo is such like a part of conversation that because the public is so cued into the inner workings of the business, it's funny that that becomes such a big point of conversation for people that quite frankly never cared or spoke about it before. Like you never really heard it publicly talked about, about how much money it cost. And you know, I mean, you'll hear people that aren't in the business. I get friends of mine that are just like, I heard this cost this much to do when they did this. And it's wild that we kind of let that out, which fine, but it was something that was sexy to me when I was young. It kept movies a little bit more fantasy based. Um, not knowing so much. And I feel like oh, we yeah. know so much, it's almost stripped away some of that, which is maybe my opinion on Marvel and the, you know, the Marvel fran- the Marvel world and the superhero universe is that people are so aware and they're almost a part of it. That's right. why um, on a personal level, not to offend and, you know, but, I just, I'm not, I don't really dig in the way that I love, sto- st- you know, organic story of life, slice of life shit is more my, al- just being a comedian. No, I, I didn't grow up with that stuff. I didn't have comic books. Right, me neither. Um, I read a little bit of science fiction, not a lot, um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just very Newtonian in terms of like, how the universe works like i feel i mostly live in a world that adheres to like newtonian principles of like gravity and shit right so that's so i'm in a sense too earth bound to to kind of completely surrender that however um i i still am looking for ways to push you know my boundaries a little bit. I've got a thing I'm hoping to do in the fall, depending on how all the entertainment industry stuff plays out. That's a kind of thing that I haven't done before, um, where where I'm sort of dipping my toe into uh, a world in which some of these rules don't apply. It's very specific, um, and it feels organic because of somebody in my family who um, uh, was was connected to this way of thinking and believing. <laughs> so, and then something down the road from that is a little further, is almost in, in it's a comedy, but it's a very, it's very stylized um, in a way that I've never attempted before. Like it's, the the central gimmick of it is is significant and um it's either the movie i was born to make this is where i kind of put it all together because it's pretty it's a pretty crazy central idea and people go oh he he got there or right (laughs) or or it's not the polar opposite yeah. yeah um but that's fine i mean it's it's not I don't, I, I've never let what people might think of something determine whether or not I want to do something. Like, I'm prepared for anything. I'm prepared for people to really be upset or angry. Um, it's, that's, when I was growing up, that wasn't viewed as a negative. The, the thing that was the worst was you know a shrug mm. as though it like never existed that's every filmmaker's nightmare yeah like it's if people are pissed off at least they're engaged right you know but for for and it happens to everybody it certainly happens to me if if somebody mentions something or, or the, the best is somebody did that come out oh fuck the pain <laughs> The pain that you, that did come, oh, it did, did huh? Did that come out? Oh, shit, I missed that. How was it? Is yeah. it, I should see it. Uh, yeah, you should see it, yeah. <laughs> it's a fucking, but that hurts. That's, no, look, that's, that's the, there's too many choices yes. for people. Like, they're, they're, they really are. Like, they've done studies that show 
at a certain point, having too many choices creates more anxiety than it does pleasure in having choices. And the number is around seven. It's wow. pretty low. Yeah. And that makes sense when you're on one of your like apps okay. and, and you're going through the carousel or like clicking down, like how quickly you move into a place of like, how the fuck am I going to figure out what I want to watch? Yeah. You know, I'll like, just go back to watching Family Feud. Yeah. Or, I yeah check something out. you've seen before. Yeah. I check it's out. like comfort food. It is. Uh, truly. I mean, that's kind of, that is what I do often. Unfortunately, that's why I'm behind on so much stuff because I just, it's hard for me to get uh, to dig in. Also, and there, here's a direct parallel. What, uh, perhaps like my anxiety and and depression that I've lived with for years, that I've gone through big highs and big lows, that typically dictates what I'm really jumping into. And I know that's this is very it's very obvious, seems obvious and literal, but like the music I listen to changes week to week to week. Like in my car, sometimes I told my wife, I was, I was like, you won't believe this, but I've been listening for the past two weeks to the Grateful Dead radio. And I was never a big Dead right. fan, but now I can't stop fucking listening to it because I'm really enjoying it. Right. And it also is, it's dictated by what's going on in my life. And so I find that happens obviously in my comedy. Our comedy is usually based, stand up is usually based on life, but it's the same thing with projects too, where I read a thing not too long ago that was given to me an opportunity and um, I wasn't really interested, even though some of the people were, it was fantastic. I just thought I wasn't going to do it justice. And that was a thing I was privileged enough to say, no, thank you, but no, thank you. But I guess what I'm lobbing to you is, do you find that that stays pretty constant, that what's going on in your real life in your practical world is, is affecting the way you're making these movies or picking your projects or oh, saying no. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, it should. Yeah. Um, but some people can really kind of separate. I feel like I have friends that can kind of box things away and, and transform into the thing they need to, and then go back to the thing they need to. I found it really hard to not soak in some of that energy. So like when you're picking, you know, has there been a moment in your life of, you know, either great trauma or great joy that really influenced the thing that made it great, you think? Well, I just think you're, you're so clearly influenced by the people that you're close to. So, um, my wife and I spent a lot of time together talking mm -hmm. and showing each other things. And so that's, that's a, that's a huge influence just on where my lens is pointing. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so, and I embrace that as part of how you keep evolving, you know, um, She's I'm, a muse of sorts. Well, I'm just saying, like, yeah, we're 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 in a long term, ongoing conversation yeah. about everything. You still talk to your wife? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, Every day. So it's it's uh, I view that as as a necessary and healthy part of just having your interests, you know, expand. Yeah. Um, over time, so I. I try to, I really try to make that process of deciding pretty instinctual and, and efficient. Like nobody, a producer, very good producer, um, once said to me, nobody minds a fast no. And it's really true. Yeah. Like if, if, if that's how you feel, like every, if you don't waste somebody's time, they're so thankful right? because nobody wants their time wasted yeah so get it over with and it's and, and again sometimes it can be hard because it may be a close friend and maybe something that under three years ago you it might have been a hell yeah and you're just different now yeah. um or you've got something in front of you that you feel is a little close to that they couldn't possibly know that because you haven't told anybody about that thing that hasn't happened yet so I'm I'm just trying to keep it as lean and mean as possible. That process of what I say yes to. 
Um, and also it's, it's, I, I still, I've got various prusorial projects that I'm involved with and I'm not sure why, cause I don't like producing, but I like seeing something happen that might not have happened otherwise. Yeah. That's, that's, I like that, you know, that a thing gets made and people go to work because I, I helped. Um, I like that, but it's just the reality of being a producer, which is all the phone calls are bad and it's your, your, you're a doula for the actual people giving birth to this thing. So it's, it's kind of odd. It's not fun to be a doula for the business. You'd no, rather be I mean, birth. well, what I, what I desperately hope for is that I've helped get the thing on a rail and see, call me when you have a cut to right, show. Right. That's my fantasy is that there's a big gap um, where they're off doing their thing. And it's working. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you were honest about it when you're like, I hate producing. It's, it's it, tough. The, the, well, I can say that because I've had really good producers my whole career from the very beginning. And um, that's a, that's your, you got to like it. You, you've got to like oh, doing yeah. that job, which is fielding all these people coming at you with problems. Yeah. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm fine doing the creative version of that and standing on set and trying to figure out something. Um, but, but this part of it, um, I, I just, I don't have that gene that makes me like, um, solving those problems. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it's, trust me. I, I see it being inside of it and you know, like when my parents are like, what does a producer do? And it's a really tough thing to explain in a layman way because you're like, well, it's extremely intricate. It's really, it's odd. It's, it's not, there's not really like a layout. You're the, you're the facilitator. Right. You know, and the parent, Right. you know, right, right. I mean, you need to, you should be. I, I, I look to that. I, I want somebody to, if necessary, kind of have their hand on my lower back because I'm about to back into a, a hole, right. you know, um, and so it's a very, I really value it. And that brain trust, you know, it's, there are very frank conversations that go on about what we're doing and how we feel about what we're doing and whether it could be better. Um, and we sort of figure that out and then disseminate that information to everybody else. But the, the brain trust of which the producers obviously a, a a really significant part is an important aspect of my way of working. Yeah. Um, that, that it's the Pixar credo of be wrong as fast as you can. So you want to be talking to people who you respect, um, who are kind of stress testing everything to make sure we don't leave here without getting it. Right. You know, sometimes you have to go back, um, on, the, on the show that, um, we just finished full circle. Ed Solomon, the writer and I, and Casey Silver, the producer were, it was the kind of thing that, that lent itself to a certain amount of recalibrating as you were going. And we were chasing ideas that we thought were better. You yeah. know, we saw things when we saw things that we didn't feel were working, we attacked those. And when we saw stuff that was working better than we hoped, we're like, let's expand that avenue, like add two lanes to that because that shit's working. So that takes fluidity. It takes security. It takes trust, you know, that, that I'm not going to, that it's not arbitrary that if I say I want to go this way and it's a pretty significant shift that it's because I can, I can explain why I right. can walk you through from this point to the end of the thing. This is why I want to go this way. Um, and then you, you start to work on it, but that's the fun part. Right. The, those conversations are, I think those are fun. Yeah. Because, well, because it's, it's, uh, 
it's exciting. It's like when you're a teenager and you're building something with friends and it's like <laughs> the world, the wonderment of the world and of the, this endless possibilities of how this fort could look when it's over. It's, it is, I mean, it, you know, we are all children to it in this business of like, you know, I think about it all the time. I can't believe they let us do the thing. I always, I'm always like, I can't believe they let us do the thing. You know, and that's pretty good. It's amazing. Now, are you somebody who's a reuser? Do you oftentimes work the exact same? Yeah. yeah, there's a there's it, it's not exactly the same every time, but there's there is a there is a, a fairly um, like your DP has been the same for a lot or no? Well, that would be me. So that's oh, right. Easy. You're doing everything. I just do. Yeah. I just use that's a right. different you name. Use, you use different versions of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it you again you've got to find this balance of it's efficient when people know what you like and how you work and how you communicate um but you don't you want to keep from falling into a place where it becomes predictable um and and there's not there's not as much attention being paid to the things that need close attention cuz it's just all it's gotten too familiar. Right. It's gotten a little loose. You know what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta kind of find this zone of really good people who who know you, but you know, keep consistently, you know, tracking everything that needs to be tracked, and not not feeling like, oh, I've done this a million times for Stephen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you've got it's you. Everybody, it still has to be like the first time. Yeah, of course. You know, like, yeah, you need to create. Well, that, that those lines that that are hard to draw sometimes in our business of prof, not professionalism, but it is still a working relationship of like you're a boss and it's your buddy, and you know, it's also like yeah, but it still have to be. It's just very intimate. Yeah, it just it is. You know, and you it's, become it's, s- close with people, so yeah, it's even harder. Yeah, and and like I said, it's it's you're the thing itself, the thing that you're doing when the cameras are rolling is this highly personal kind of emotional thing. Um, so it's, it's working. I, I would, my experience of it is, you know, a shooting day is like three or four, like normal days. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's that, that's how it just feels. It's like staring at the sun. Like it just fit time feels very sort of dense. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just, you feel like a lot of things happened in that 10 hours. You know what I mean? Yes. And, yeah. Um, and Those days are exhausting sometimes. Yeah. And it's just, it's, 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 you have to, I think, again, be sensitive to the, the mood of the crew and mm-hmm. the cast um, and make sure that, you know, Everybody is using all of their available real estate to think about the thing, yeah. the thing that we're here to do, and not stories about what somebody's up to. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I don't want stories about me. Like, I want you thinking about the thing. I don't want you thinking about me or something I did or something I said. Like, now I've pulled you out, I've broken the spell. You know, so I'm very sensitive to when I feel like the spell is being broken by someone or something and, and trying to get us back to that place of, of focus. Um, and I like to have fun, like, you know, yeah, talking you, about talking. If you're hanging out with Tim Oliphant, like you're laughing. Yeah, you're fucking around. Or, you know, yeah. you're laughing. Um, but you're focused like you, you know what you're there to do. Um, so it's a funny, there's, it is like a band in, in a sense. Um, and then you have to directorially kind of be in two places at the same time. You know, you have to be in a place of extreme presence where there is no other shot. This is the shot. Yeah. And seeing the whole thing from 30,000 feet to make sure that shot belongs with all the other shots um, and that fits into the larger mosaic of the whole piece. So you've got to sort of be in these two places at the same time. Um, But 
nothing is more fun than a sort of happy, unexpected thing that an actor does. You know what I mean? That's just that happens. Yeah. You know, it's just that's that's your. I'm trying to set up a situation where that naturally occurs. Right. You know, the organic. It, yeah, just something, you know, and to, it's, it's, if you've cast properly um, and you've set it up, it will. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it will happen. You'll get some, you'll get some new stuff that you never would have thought of that really sings, you know. In here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. Ooh, I love to say hello to HelloFresh. HelloFresh. You're going to get yourself some farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip those trips to the grocery store like I do. I hate going to the grocery store. You can count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. I've been talking about HelloFresh for for too long now, all right? These pre-portioned ingredients, they help cut down on food waste with step-by-step instructions making cooking a breeze. It's so easy. It's not a chore. I'm a stupid guy. I've told you guys that. I'm not so smart. And uh, I'm looking to eat well, and as well as I can eat depends on what's in front of me. And with HelloFresh, it, it makes it so simple. This summer, uh, they've had so many menu features like the Calorie Smart, the Protein Smart Lunch, and dinner options, new vegan options. Uh, for those of you, HelloFresh makes it easy to reach your food, food goals with flavorful recipes that leave you feeling satisfied, not overwhelmed, and not too many leftovers that might go to waste. They get you the options uh, that you want when it comes to make for dinner, not same old thing all the time. All right, nobody wants to make the same old dish. That's why they got 40 recipes to choose from every single week. 40 recipes every single week. You're never going to get bored. You're always going to find something new uh, to try out and to fall in love with. I also love the fast and fresh. These recipes are great. You can make them in 15 minutes or less, which is about the time that I have in my day to cook something. And it's 25% cheaper than takeout. I know you like takeout, but it's going to make you feel bad. You're going to be hungry in an hour and a half. So why not use HelloFresh? That's why it's uh, number one. America's number one meal kit, all right? They got quality proteins, fresh produce, and plans for all your lifestyles, okay? So, how do you get this? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Whiskey50 and use the code Whiskey50 for 50% off plus free shipping. What did you just say? I said go to HelloFresh.com slash Whiskey50. Use code Whiskey50 for 50% off plus free shipping today. HelloFresh, it's America's number one meal kit. Ginger. I like gingers. It's tough to, it's, 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 it's really hard to, for people to understand, but you said it in a way that's pretty powerful of how you have to be doing multiple things at the same time, but also be in separate places at the same time in your mind of, of balancing that as a director, which is why I don't think I'll ever do it. I don't, I mean, I know I'll never do it. I have no business doing that. I sit in my little stupid brain once I can get in my little space and I like to sit in that and then you know, utilize the tricks that I've learned how to, you know, get back there quicker because being a comedian is hard. Yeah. We want to fuck off. I mean, we're bound to fuck off. It's like in our DNA to see something on set and to go just float. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we're, yeah, we have the worst ADD. I mean, that's all we are, but it's impressive when every director I've worked with that shocks me with their abilities. It's typically the thing that shocked me the most is how they're able to you know, spin a few things at once, but still be present in the thing. I've never, never been able to do that. I mean, you know, no, no, you know, the no capacity up here. It's very limited. Uh, the ape brain that I've got <laughs> left over. Did, did you, when you said something about your wife, it struck me, has your wife ever liked a project and influenced you to do it? Even though you did, you were kind of like iffy about it or vice versa, where you were like, I love this thing. And she's like, I don't know if that's that good. Have you ever had that relationship? Um, she's asked me, you know, she's, she's asked, you know, why, tell me why you're, why is this a hell yeah? Right. You know, yeah. um, which is a fair question because she and the cats are impacted by these decisions. <laughs> um, right. And so it's good, it's good practice, you know, to, yeah. to, to have, a really solid answer um but you know it's it's i guess the reason that i that i think about the process of it all um is because it rep that time represents my life yeah like i've spent a lot of hours doing 
the job that I love to do, but the, I want the quality of those hours, um, to be high. Yeah. You know, I want to feel like that was worth it and it was worth, that it was worth my time and it was worth everybody's time. You know, I think the thing that will put a crew into a kind of, you know, <clears throat> neutral mode is if they roll up on a set and realize, oh, this isn't one of those situations where every shot matters. Like every shot could be in the show. Every shot. There is no let's let's just cover ourselves here. Let's the there's you can the crew can feel the difference. Right. And they're really interested when they feel like, man, every every shot is in. Yeah. So it better be good. Yeah. Um, as opposed to like they've shot way more shit than they can use by a factor of ten. So where where are we supposed to place our close attention? You know what I mean? Um, I've done a lot of those, by the way. <laughs> well, look, sometimes yeah, the sometimes the 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 sort of structure of the thing itself it defaults to that. You know what I mean? If you're on a certain kind of show and you're, you know, you're new to that job and this is a big opportunity and somebody says, hey, look, we want a lot of options uh, in the editing room. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to grind it. Right. Um, there is there you're you don't have a lot of freedom to go yeah i'm not doing that <laughs> cuz you, you, you will be fired yeah yeah um so it's 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 again to have gotten to a place of of being able to have that kind of control is is really fortunate and i was fortunate because i didn't know anybody in the entertainment industry, I was yeah, no living. Connection. Was living in a suburban subdivision in Baton Rouge. Yeah. I didn't. I had no connections to anything. Um, but I, I was very self-activated, and I was constantly writing because I knew that was a way in. I was going to have to come in through the independent route, um, and the way you do that is you write a script. And then go convince like some people to put up some money. Mm -hmm. Like I'd, it'd been, it had been done many times. Um, so that was going to be my path. And, and I just got lucky that finally, um, I wrote something that somebody read and said, I can get, I can, what do you need? Like $1.1 1 .1 million. I, I know where to get that. That's you know, powerful. Yeah. So that's, that was one way to do it. Um, and nobody, I guess my attitude was, A, it's going to happen for somebody. Somebody is going to break through at some point. It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and why shouldn't it be me? Right. Um, and nobody can keep me from writing. Right, that they can't stop. There, I, if I, and I just, and I'm not, a, I don't, I have written, but I don't consider myself a writer as defined by my definition. Like, there are real writers, and I'm somebody who wrote um, and has written. That's different. But at that point in my career, I was just, I would, I would write one thing, finish it, start another one in a very different way. I was trying out very different genres to see like what, if any, I had a facility for. Um, but I just felt like that's how you get in. You yeah. just, you write a script that somebody goes, I like that script. Are you writing right now? No, sort of supervising. Sure. A, a, a real writer, right. um, <laughs> you know. Um, and I love that. I love that part. I, I love being in the room. Um, when you have a thing that that you're going to figure out in the room as opposed to occasionally you'll have an idea and, uh, that you'll pitch to a writer and they'll go, I get it, talk to you in six weeks, and they just go off and do it. Sometimes you get into, we really got to get the dry erase board out and and map it. And 
that's really fun. That is, the, yeah, that you know is the I mean? fun part. Just well, because like, then you get to, to it's bounce. Just pure, it's just a pure creative space. Like, yeah. Um, and I'm a big believer in parameters. Like, I, I, I do think you should have an understanding of, like, so what is the scale of this? What, right. what are we thinking? Is this a $2 million movie or is this a $22 million movie? Because you make different choices in the writing based on totally. that. And, and it's really just about, well, what's the, what's the best expression of this idea? Sometimes it's the cheap version. Yeah. You know? Because uh, it's more distilled. And, right. And like you said, sometimes too many options is just too much. It's like you've got too much to do, then you can't really whittle it down to something. Some of the greatest shit has come from nothing. You know what I mean? Oh, it's yeah. like when you have nothing to do, when you have nothing to play with, you have to find everything. You have to just create it out of thin air. You know? No, it forces you to think laterally instead of vertically all the time. Right. And I think that's healthy. And I, like I said, I clearly from my comments about budgets, I like I want to know what the size of the sandbox is. You know, so I then think you know that that helps doing. me. You yeah. know, and then again, it's it's at the same time if you're staring something in the face that doesn't work, um, then all bets are off. Like it has to be fixed. Yeah. You know, if, if there, there is no walking away, if you still see things, um, that can be fixed because at a certain point it's pencils down. Yeah. It's you know? over. And, yeah. and I think that's good too. Um, you know, otherwise I think you would, I, I need to treat it like a sport. That's, that's the best version of it for me. Right. The longer I have to like mull things over, the worse they get. So I tend to like a rhythm that's, that's, that's pretty quick just because this is my experience of, of early on in my career when I was trying to figure out what kind of filmmaker I was and where my place might be in the film industry. And I was trying a lot of different kinds of films that were not being seen, but I was learning a lot. Um, and so by the time out of sight came about, I felt ready. I felt like, okay, I think I know where, who I want to be in this context. Right. And that movie felt like the perfect opportunity for me to go, I want to be working in the mainstream. I do. I just want to do it a, a certain way. Um, and the key to that is getting a great script yeah. and like movie stars, <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, it's been like that for 120 years, but, uh, this was a revelation to me. Um, <laughs> at least you figured it out. Yeah. yeah. But it was, it was a sort of watershed career moment for me. Cause if I fuck this up, I'm in real trouble. Yeah. Um, but I, I felt like I knew how to do it. Like I went in and George was attached. Jersey Films controlled it. I met with Scott Frank, the screenwriter, and I said, "This is, this is what it is, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's kind of, it's a Hal Ashby movie in terms of its approach to characters and plot, but it's it's a little more overtly uh, flashy than than." Hal Ashby, who was a very sort of almost invisible director when you watch like his great movies from the 70s, like being there or the last detail, the direction is just invisible. You know what I mean? It's all about the characters and the, yeah. they're beautifully crafted, but he doesn't, he's not trying to impress you with that. He's trying to impress you with the story and the character. So that was my huge pitch is like, in terms of its balance of drama and humor, you should be thinking about the last detail. That's how it's going to feel. Um, and everybody else in town passed on that particular opportunity. And I was literally like the last person standing. Wow. Like I was cold. I was cold. <laughs> I, was, I was out in the cold. And so this was like, this was a big, a big chance. Do, do you, in your, in your, more recent years have you tried to work with Clooney again and has is this is there something on the rise again yeah we we see each other we're we're, we're in regular communication and 
I think we both, we've talked about stuff. We, it's just got to be something like really different. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. we both, we're both excited about that. I, by the idea of like doing something after all this time. Um, but it's got to be something like really startling. Right. You something that's re- I, I just really outside yeah, that of the box. He hasn't done before and I haven't directed him doing it before. Like it's got it's got to be a character that's just like Maybe really Maybe that's subversive comedy that you talked about. Um well that's 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 for me. Thank uh, you. Exactly. I didn't think that was for me. Um You got the right hair for it actually. <laughs> uh, but and I'll tell you why okay. privately okay. that that's actually true. Okay. Um but yeah, I mean it's got to be the right thing with you and him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that again, you let the you let the universe sort of do its stuff. No, I, and I like that perspective. I think that's like the way to. As I've grown in my career, it's something that I've kind of come to terms with. That I am like, oh yeah, you just it's got to just happen the way it is. And what yeah, else I mean, can it's you do? it's the it's. I mean, I believe in pushing the ball down field. Yeah, you know what I mean, but there's, there's kind of, there's progress. And then there's like forcing something that's not moving. Right. You know, it's like resisting your attempts to move it. That's different. Um, very Sisyphus in your, in the, in the, yeah, which tends to be part of the, part of the game too. And then as you get older, um, you, you really begin to value, you know, your time yeah, and, and think about it a little differently because you know, what's required, you know, how sort of immersive it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think to, you know, to your point earlier, um, my, my, my algorithm for getting to a hell yeah, absolutely is different than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, just cause I'm a different, I'm in a different place in my life, you know, and things have happened, you yeah. know? And so, um, you know, my goal, my goal is to continue to find ways to push what I'm capable of, um, and find a spot where I, it, it works, but it might not have. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, and, and so, cause uh, I have to be scared. Like there, there has to be a, a pocket of fear surrounding some aspect of the thing. Like, or I, I feel like I'm not, um, if I'm not scared by some aspect of it, I'm not sure why I'm doing it. Um, it can be, on the Nick, it was the schedule. It was just on paper. The schedule looked like madness. Right. You know, you're really, you're going to do nine pages a day for 73 days. Really? <laughs> and then. How? Well, it determines, it means, you know, you're staging and blocking and shooting in in a way to reduce any kind of redundancy. Like yeah. talk about this, this shot's going to start here, go to there. It's going to pick up here and then I go to there. And, 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 and that means including scenes where lots of people are talking, knowing after you've watched the rehearsal and blocked it, you know, like I am only going to be on these people for this section and I'm only going to be on these people for this section. Right. I have a tendency I'm told by actors who've experienced this to sometimes in a situation like that, to not even photograph the person that's talking throughout the whole scene and just shoot reaction shots and over the shoulder <laughs> and never actually turn around. Hit the person that's on. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's, I, I've, I was told later, you know, that's kind of a thing <laughs> that you do and everybody's now had it happen to them and right. we're, we're kind of talking about it. But also it obviously worked. Well, it can. Yeah. It, you know, and again, your, your job, your job is to use composition, movement, and cutting patterns to create emphasis. Yep. You know, like what is, what is this scene really? What's really like, what's, going on? Well, my whole thing is if the sound's off, do I still know what's happening? 
just through the way it's staged and cut. It should. That's my definition of what directing is. Like, you should be able to watch it silent and go, I know exactly what's happening in this scene, mm -hmm. even though it's all just people talking. Um, so that's, I work back from there often, like, what if there's no audio? How would I, how would I lay this out visually Why? and have people get it? Um, and then sometimes you're just, we're doing this in one because we have an hour <laughs> we and, and it's three pages. Choice, yeah. So <laughs> we have to do so it. So let's work from that. Like, how do we, keep, let's get this thing knowing that, can I get it on its feet? so that it's moving right. and you don't even notice that it's one shot because I've hidden all the moves in the in your guys' movement. You know, that's fun, can be yeah. fun. Yeah, my buddy Michael Angarano did that, that show Nick with you and uh, had an enjoyable time and it's so funny because when he... He's great and he's a good filmmaker. He's, he's, he's phenomenal. He's such a bright, talented kid. I wouldn't say bright. I don't want to give him smart because well, he's a close friend. So I wouldn't say that. I don't, I don't, well, you know him. him. I don't really yeah, know him. So he may, yeah. he may be, <laughs> he's, he's an actor. Yeah. yeah. He's peacocking a little bit. He may pretend it's all it, actors pretend at the end of the day, most actors are, um, well, when the, did you, when tell me your, uh, if I can turn the table. Yeah. So give me your moment of understanding that per performing is like, I want to do that. I think, uh, like uh, as a, as like, I want to pursue this seriously. You no, could have been six for no, all I know. No, but. Well, uh, uh, I, my dad just joked about it. When my, when my stepdad married my mom, um, I was, uh, actually five or six or well, yeah, something like that. And, uh, I had learned the song one singular sensation uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I kept saying to my dad, can I sing? Because I was, I would love whenever now, there where was, where did a, you hear this? The song? Yeah. Uh, where did you hear it the it, first time? It was like a, um, uh, a daycare program or something like that was teaching us songs my mom was a, I was a single, sing, had a single, right. uh, raised by a single mother for a while. And then I'd go to these sitters or daycare programs or all this stuff. And then, but I kind of yeah, specifically. But it wasn't a touring company of a chorus line. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no. But I remember seeing bands or musicians and being like infatuated, right. but not having the drive to want to play music. But I just thought uh, getting up in front of people was so cool for some reason. And at my parents' wedding, I, I begged them to let me sing. And I'm not, I, I couldn't sing. Right. But you just wanted to do But it. I wanted to tell, I told a few jokes. I told two jokes and then I sung part of it. Uh, and by the way, the jokes killed, I crushed. Uh, but I do remember that feeling of people being impressed that you had the ability to kind of control a room. I thought that was wild. And, um, then that's, I, no, that's, that's a superpower. It just, it just felt, it was yeah. something I couldn't believe happened. And then as life had gone on, I, you know, I was obsessed with comedy when I was young and I kind of lied to myself and everybody in my family because I never really admitted that I was going to do it. I really did lie saying I was going to go and I, out of college, maybe get a job. And I had done a little bit of theater in school and I continually lied to myself because I didn't want to let myself down. Right. So. But honestly, since I was a kid, I was obsessed with, I used to, and the comedy route was Carson. I used to watch Carson a lot when I was, a, when I was a little, little kid, I was a, obsessed with, um, the format. Right. I thought that was so cool to talk to people and to joke and, and that there were these uh, winks at the audience. And that was probably my, my, um, initial, uh, idea of the world of comedy. And then as I grew, I saw what what expanded right. Eddie Murphy changed yeah, the yeah. way I saw everything in the fucking world. I was like, holy shit, you can make fun of like dark, weird personal stuff and everybody likes it. And, um, but that was, but for the acting side, um, Jim Carrey was, uh, like my hero as a kid. And I wanted to be that so bad. I was like, God, I want to be that thing. I want to be <laughs> free to like look odd right. in front of people. And he was it to me. Yeah. That was, that was, that was genuinely the, he was just so like mesmerizing. Everything yeah. he did was obsessed. I was obsessed yeah. as a kid. 
he made half of the country talk out of their buttholes. You yeah. know what I mean? It was, uh, what a great trick he pulled. But it, it worked. It worked brilliantly. And so anyway, that's, that was kind of how I started to fall in love with comedy and performing. And acting was later in my life because I, or later in my career because I just didn't think I could do it. I never bought myself. A, I was like, I'm not going right. to, I'm not going to be able to do it. But it's been okay. And I'm going to, I want to do it now forever. I mean, I think as I get older, I've want, I'm more attracted to it than I've ever been. I've had great experiences um, casting comedians yeah. in like dramatic roles. Um, it's, it's, uh, I've found that the energy they bring is, it, it just, it, it's kind of slightly off yeah. in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on the informant, you know, everybody, almost, almost everybody around Matt in the informant is a comedian. Yeah. And they were great. Um, and we just, um, we just used, Jim Gaffigan in full circle. I love Gaffigan. And he's so good. Like yeah. he's, this is a real like dramatic role. And he is so good. Like talk about something out of a seventies movie, you know, like he's, he's great and was yeah. just a total, you know, doll to, to yeah. deal he's with. The best. Like he's a total pro. He's very funny. Um, but is completely prepared and fearless, yeah. you know, just that's what you want is 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 people who just aren't protecting anything well the good thing about comics in film and television to me that gives me comfort is typically not always but we don't really have to look cool i think a lot of comics you know you want to look presentable as an adult at some point in your career but the comedian's first goal is never to like you know look hot or right right we would rather steal the scene from a thing that we've said or right. did. We like when I know I shot something well, uh, and I know I did like, you know, curb was a big deal for me when I shot with Larry and making him laugh. I could have been naked and people could have been laughing at my, my little tiny penis. <laughs> but the fact that he was laughing, right. it didn't, nothing mattered. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you say. That fearlessness of like, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks as long as people that I'm making the product with are like, this is fucking good. Yeah. It just feels so, uh, you feel, I mean, limitless. You're like, I can do fucking anything because we're making this thing churn and it's, and it's humming and happening. There's no better to me. That's, that's where the pinnacle of people that don't understand why certain comics want to act. It's like, because it's, it's the mo to me, it's like the, it's like injected with steroids. It's right. comedy on its highest level because you get to bounce with other humans yeah. that are good at it. So I've, that's always been, you know, my, my world of it. But I'm, what I'm interested in when you said that you're working on something more in the comedy space is because getting more into that, this part of your career, I think that's, it's so cool. Cause it's again, like you said, it's not what you've always been doing. And that's to me is when you make the best stuff, knock on wood. I, I would hope. Yeah, I guess we're going to find out, but we're going to find it, out. It's it's like I said, it's I'm excited about it. I'm scared about it. Um so I feel ready. Um but it's it's we're in such a we're in such a weird time in terms of you know, where do movies belong? Yeah, where do and they what belong? What is a movie? Yeah. Um so it's it's I'm I'm not as despairing as as some people um i guess part of it is because it seems inevitable that these things you know evolve over time not always in ways that that make you happy but you've just got to keep figuring it out you know and my goal is to be the cockroach of the entertainment industry <laughs> and that there's like no version of it that i can't find uh, right. you know, a kitchen with some <laughs> shit in the cupboard. So you'll find your way. In. Yeah, yeah. Like that's, I'm, I'm like, well, how do we work with this? Um, but I, I always feel, and there are some, there's some similarities to what was happening with the studios in the sixties that led to this kind of American new wave of movies from 66 to the late seventies. 
um, you can kind of feel some of the same echoes of what was happening there just before a new thing kind of burst into the culture and took everything in a different direction. Now, things have changed, you know. Uh, the way we watch stuff has changed and what we watch has changed. But I still, I still and, and believe that there's somebody finishing something right now or working on something right now that six months from now could completely change the narrative yeah. and take the whole business like in a different direction. Like I, I, I want to believe that that's possible. And I think it is possible. So, um, the, the, the goal I think is, is to, as you hope that that's the case is to try and be a kind of contributing party to that. Yeah. You know, like, well, wh what could I be making that would potentially, if it works, send a message to like, oh shit, stuff like this works now. That's good to know because it opens up a, a little space here that wasn't open right. beforehand. Um, I mean, Sex Lies was a real beneficiary of some of fortuitous timing. It, it showed up at the end of a decade in which the studios really took back control of the movies. And it wasn't a great decade for American cinema, except for a handful of independent filmmakers. As far as studio movies went, the eighties was like pretty corporate. Yeah. And people were just ready to start seeing things again that felt hand crafted and had a voice right. and a signature. Like they just, they wouldn't, I don't even think they would have articulated this to you. It's just when they started seeing it, they went, that feels better. I like that. And yeah. so that's what happened is we and some other people just kind of rolled up at a time where people were ready to like see something that, that felt human. I think we're ready now. I think there's a new change coming. Well, now. that's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. who's to say that that people are like, I wanna, I wanna move back to a place that's more grounded. I hope. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, a lot of that audience um, migrated to television because the kind of things they like. Look, Traffic and Aaron today as movies don't work. Yeah, well, it's and in yeah. a theater. Not in a theater. They do not, not perform no. the way they perform. Be great on HBO or something. Well, like that. that's yeah. where that's well, exactly. I mean, I did three, four, three and a half because Magic Mike Warner's decided after they saw it to put it in the theater, even though it was made for the platform. But Let Them All Talk, No Sudden Move, and Kimmy are mid-level movies for grown-ups that I sort of made my bread and butter on decades ago yeah that's where you have to go to make those movies now because theatrically when you add the marketing costs in like it just doesn't work yeah the math doesn't work so you know but we're we're for the first time confronting a version of the business in which we don't have all the information that we're used to having right it's the streaming world it's kind of a black box and um, they know what's happening, but they won't tell us. Let us know. Will you just let us know, streaming world? <laughs> Either way, I am. Uh, I'm excited to see what's next. Um, yeah, me too. And uh, I want to say, I want to say thank you graciously for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Uh, I am a fan. I hope that we can work together someday. If we can't, I will hold it against you. I've done that for for many years with a lot of people. I have grudges now. Okay. Um, if people... All right. So you're coming in hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if people uh, interested in the world want to taste something delicious, I hope they go grab a bottle of Singani 63. It's actually, it's very, very good. Um, it's available most places. I imagine that oh, you yeah. can pick up alcohol. Yeah. Um, and please do it so uh, Stephen can make more movies because otherwise, if this thing tanks, we're in deep shit. Yeah, it's all going away. Yeah, it's all going away. Yeah. Um, we end the episode the same way. Uh, you end the episode with one word or one phrase. Now, it used to be a word, and a lot of people say, I don't know one word. So they would just say a phrase. 
uh, or something that's, that means something to them. But you have to look in that camera right there and say one word or one phrase when you're ready. Panic has never solved anything in the history of the world. In here, we pour whisk, 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 whisk. Oh, that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. Gingers are oh, hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers.